I'd like to call to order the Board of Education uh, meeting for Monday, February 26, 2024. Ms. Sauber, please call the roll. Mr. Dahl. Here. Dr. Graff. Here. Dr. Rohr. Here. Megan Sparks. Here. Mrs. Dernbaugh. Here. Please stand for the pledge. <laughs> to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? So moved. Second. Please call the roll. Mr. Dahl? Yes. Dr. Graff? Yes. Dr. Rohr? Yes. Megan Sparks? Yes. Mrs. Dernbaugh? Yes. Uh, first up is honors and building reports. So good evening, everyone. Uh, this is one of our exciting nights of the year. Uh, we have several honors and building reports uh, to share uh, with all of you in the public this evening. Uh, first of all, uh, we're going to have Mr. Tarpey share some information about our Teacher of the Year, Kim Bain, from the South Unit. Thank you, Mr. Wesley, and good evening, everybody. Uh, as Mr. Wesley said, this is uh, one of our favorite board member uh, board meetings of the year because we uh, have the opportunity to recognize uh, one outstanding member of our staff. And so uh, I'll be speaking to you tonight about the um, Ohio Teacher of the Year pres uh, uh, program. So each year the district uh, participates in the Ohio of the Year program. It's sponsored by the Ohio Department of Education. The mission of the Ohio Teacher of the Year program is to honor, promote, and recognize excellence in teaching and the teaching profession. This year the district nominee was selected right here from Centerville High School. And I'm very pleased to announce that the district has selected uh, Mrs. Kim Bain for this very prestigious award. So I'll have Kim and her nominating uh, principal, Ms. Regal, step uh, to the podium, please. Um, Kim is a science teacher here at Centerville High School, uh, right here in the South Unit. She's worked for the Centerville City Schools for the past 18 years. She's a proud graduate of the University of Dayton, and she spent her entire professional teaching career right here in Centerville. Uh, Kim's nominator is South Unit Principal, uh, Ms. Jen Regal. And Ms. Regal will be making uh, a few comments about uh, Kim here in just, uh, in just a few minutes. Um, before she makes her comments, um, I would have our uh, community uh, specialist, um, Sarah Swan, if she would run, we have a video prepared for um, everybody tonight, and it's a video of both Kim and uh, Ms. Regal introducing themselves and speaking a little bit more about this program. So go ahead, uh, Michael. Hi, my name is Kim Bain, and I teach science here at Centerville High School. This is my 18th year of teaching, and all 18 years have been right here um, at the high school. Um, I mostly teach biology with freshmen and sophomores. When I catch it, and it's um, kind of hit or miss, but sometimes you have that moment when a student has a question, um, and so I um, help them um, in a way to kind of guide them to the answer, and there's just this wonderful moment where um, you can see it on their face when they figure it out, like their eyes get real wide, um, and you can just see that they understand um, what the concept was, um, and that moment keeps me coming back. Um, every day. I love seeing that on kids' faces um, and just being able to um, ex you know, be on this journey with them, this learning journey um, of biology um, is, is really awesome. Hi, I'm thrilled to recognize Kim Bame as the Centerville City Schools Teacher of the Year nomination. Miss Bame ignites curiosity, she fosters creativity, and she makes her classroom come alive. Some of her students describe her classroom as hands-on, lively, and engaging. She uses music such as creating songs and raps for her students to remember the content, as well as dances and other catchy ways to make sure that the content is understood and learned. Mrs. Bame is reflective in her teaching and is inclusive and ensures that all of her students feel safe in the classroom. Congratulations to Kim Bame as being the nomination for Centerville City Schools for Teacher of the Year. I want to thank uh, Mrs. Swan for putting together that piece and also just to um, let everybody know that uh, it will be available on our website. So 
Uh, you can go back and watch that again if you like. Um, so just a little bit about Kim. Um, she's an outstanding and accomplished teacher that excels in her classroom uh, with her students, really in every aspect. Uh, she truly embraces our district's strategic plan and mission of empowering, challenging, and, support, and supporting every learner every day. Mrs. Bain possesses a can-do attitude and understands that there are no days off when implementing this plan. Evidence for this can be seen in part with her empathetic and student-centered approach with the instructional process. She is simply a very caring person who genuinely respects and attends to each of her students in a very personalized and in, in individualized manner. Um, Kim uh, stated to me, quote, I enjoy acting and singing, so I often perform skits and songs to help make the content come alive for my students. And you heard that uh, in the video. So, well, Kim, I didn't know that about you. I didn't know that you had that skill set. Uh, but I'm sure um, this recognition tonight indeed validates that your methodology does work in bringing your classroom alive for your students. So um, it's a real honor, Kim, this evening to uh, recognize you. And at this time, I would like uh, to invite uh, Ms. Regal to make some comments. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to talk about uh, Mrs. Kim Bain for Centerville City Schools Teacher of the Year. It's pretty exciting. Mrs. Bain fosters that creativity, critical thinking, and collaboration, equipping your students with the skills that they need to excel in this ever-changing world. Through innovative teaching methods, as described um, already with her skits and singing, she cultivates an environment where curiosity thrives and learning becomes a journey of discovery. She ensures that every student, regardless of background or ability, feels valued, respected, and seen. Mrs. Bain's classroom is a testament to her unwavering commitment to empower, challenge, and support all of her students. Beyond the walls of her classroom, Mrs. Bain also inspires and mentors her colleagues. She's always ready to lend a helping hand, share her wealth of knowledge and expertise. Her leadership extends far beyond the classroom, making a lasting impact on this entire school community. It is a pleasure to have her here at Centerville High School and specifically as a South Unit teacher. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Regal. And so at this time, I would like to present uh, Kim. I'd like to present you with this uh, certificate of award and give you an opportunity to make a few comments. So congratulations. Thank you, and um, as some people know, and some people maybe just learned recently, um, I do love to act and sing. Um, so I thought I would start by singing for you a little snippet um, of one of the songs I do for my students um, that I wrote about genetics. So it goes like this. Do 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 do. Summer pea plants, they have all these traits. But some traits disappear when they mate. I have a plant with round yellow seeds, and another plant, seeds wrinkled and green. Dihybrid cross, we'll see which trait is boss in uh, all those summer pea plants. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you. And I also then have a few specific thank yous. Um, first to Jen Regal um, for nominating me and um, all of the administrative team for selecting me. I'm so honored um, and excited uh, to be the Teacher of the Year, especially since um, I love what I do. Um, I my students are great, and I love that I get to come into work every day and talk about biology. Um, and be with them and guide them on their journey to learn about the study of life. And so um, to be recognized for that tonight, um, I really feel like I'm living the dream. Um, and then I also want to thank my family for their love and support, and especially my husband, Jonathan. Um, he was a stay-at-home dad for many years and now is a substitute teacher here in the district. And so in those roles, um, he has taken care um, and handled most of the 
staying home with our kids when they're sick and taking them to the dentist and the orthodontist, um, which then allowing me to be here uh, doing what I love um, with, you know, kind of minimal interruptions. And I really appreciate that. So thank you, Jonathan. Um, and then lastly, uh, just kind of a thank you to the community in general. Um, I'm really grateful to work in a district and a community um, where teachers are valued um, and supported because I don't think that's necessarily the case everywhere. Um, I'm not from here originally. I grew up in Cincinnati, um, but when I first started working here, I heard that Centerville was described as warm and cheerful. Um, and I truly think it does live up to that description. Um, so thank you to the community for making this a great place to work and a great place to live. Um, Kim's credentials will now be reviewed by a state uh, selection panel and they'll choose uh, one individual to represent uh, the Ohio Teacher of the Year. We actually over the years have had, um, they actually, they actually uh, select uh, uh, five finalists and they pick one of the five. And so we've had um, um, great fortune of having uh, two or three individuals make it to in, into that final five. So Kim ha has an excellent uh, chance at that. And uh, I think um, uh, you all uh, can see the talent level that, uh, that she possesses. And so um, I just want to again say uh, thank you, Kim, uh, for all of your hard work and um, appreciate that. I want to wish you good luck with the state level of competition. And let's give her one more round of applause. That's pretty hard to follow. So thank you, Mrs. Bame. Congratulations. Um, we really appreciate what you do. I, I know tonight you really set the bar high for the rest of our presentations. And so uh, no pressure from uh, anybody else that's here tonight. Um, our second presentation, um, just a little bit of a background information. Over a year ago, we started having some um, uh, building reports, uh, having the opportunity to have some of our administrators and special uh, folks in our district and our buildings. Uh, to do presentations and we've talked um, for a year now the importance of our guidance counselors and what they do uh, in our buildings and what they do specifically for our kids and for our parents and so I'm really pleased tonight to uh, introduce to you our guidance counselors who are here uh, no one would take ownership on who was in charge so I'm going to ask all the counselors to please come forward to the podium and they'll have a brief presentation on what they do at each of their levels uh, this evening Hi, my name is Amy I, and I am the counselor at Primary Village North. So we are going to just kind of talk about our roles and responsibilities, and we're going to start with our littlest learners, which we have preschool through first grade at Primary Village North and Primary Village South. A combined total of 1,345 students right now, um, and there's one counselor in each building, North and South. So the overall... Um, where process that we start with is the MTSS process, which is supporting our students, whether that's academically or through social emotional learning. And in the MTSS process, uh, the counselors are a big part of the core and the SEL. So starting at tier one supports, which are just your general classroom supports, I go in and help teachers when they have questions, need help with students. I help, we have adopted a character strong curriculum that's now used in our school across the board. And um, it's called Purposeful People. And the teachers can teach lessons about um, the different character traits. There's nine different character traits in that that they folk, um, month by month go through. And then for the process beyond the classroom, if it goes to tier two with students that need more support for behavior, um, emotional issues, anxiety, then they're considered tier two and they may come to small groups or individual counseling with me. Right now I run nine small groups where I focus on 
emotional regulation, um, friendship skills, social skills, and then sometimes it's one-on-one -on -one counseling for just those day-to-day -day things that, that arise. Uh, in addition, I coordinate and um, help implement the 504s in the building. So when our students need accommodations due to ADHD or maybe a medical issue, I um, help with writing the reviews of those 504s and making sure that all of the teachers, integrated arts staff are aware of that and help implement those as well. Then I support um, with the administering of MAP, our um, are testing any uh, mandated assessments. I help teachers just with the logistics of that, um, makeup tests, small group testing. And then finally, a lot of what I do is parent support and resources for families, which we have found have become more and more um, prevalent in the recent years. Um, things that have been around for a long time, like adopt a family and our food to go program where we get bags of food from local churches that have an organization, the food goes home with um, students that need it for the weekend. Um, Dayton Children's, we're now in contact um, in communication with them and I, we, I act as a liaison for kids who have other mental health needs that might be looking for outside counseling or um, support groups for parents and that kind of thing. And then I'm also a part of a family um, school and community engagement committee where once a month I go to those meetings and we learn more about how we can help support our families in the community. And I think that kind of wraps up my part. She basically said everything that I was about to say also. <laughs> so, um, but that's okay because much of what we do across the district, across all of the buildings is very similar. We just do it in different ways and we differentiate the way that we meet those needs with a lot of the sim similar resources. Um, I'm Valerie Durkle. I am the school counselor at Normandy and I'm the representative for grades two through five. Um, there are six elementary counselors and six elementary buildings. So that means we have one per building and we're serving um, about 2,400 students in second, third, fourth, and fifth grades. Um, we, over the years, are seeing an increasingly high level of need among all students. And so, as school counselors, we try to just reduce the stigma and with, associated with mental health and um, mental health and be sort of a, a bridge between families and teachers and the community. And um, we do work in partnership with a lot of local resources, as Amy said, food to go. We also um, are filling needs through care portal, uh, um, a care portal with local churches. So there are there's so much um, need in a community that in our community that people are completely oblivious to, and much of the work that counselors do, a lot of people are oblivious to because it's behind the scenes, it's confidential. We have to be careful who knows what, and so a lot of the things that we do happens in ways that most people don't even realize it. So we do the small group interventions. Um, we're really a, a heavy or big layer in our PBIS support. So positive behavior interventions for students. Um, at the building wide level, we're doing vertical team meetings with grade levels across, you know, um, vertical teams versus grade level teams. We're supporting our character education program because what we're really trying to do in the earlier grade is build the foundation that kids are no longer always getting at home. So um, a lot of kids should be able to come to school to learn, but they're not, they can't learn until their basic needs are met. So we're there to kind of fill in those gaps. Um, we are partnering with a lot. There, the community is really recognizing the need for mental health support. So a lot of what we also do is collaborate with families and raise awareness about what is in the community because a lot of times it's an idea that kind of seems far out of reach, but we try to make those connections when families and parents don't know how or where or are too intimidated to make those connections themselves. So um, it's a lot. We just continue to be the bridge between the school, the community, and the children that we serve. So, let's see here. 
So I get to talk a little bit about middle school. Um, first of all, I'm really glad that uh, Amy and Valerie did not sing their parts because uh, I have to put even a little bit more pressure on me. Uh, do we have any parents of middle schoolers here tonight? I, you are in my thoughts and prayers. <laughs> it, this is a really, this is a challenging age group. We see, you know, these young people come on in from elementary and they're yay big and they leave us and they look like Sasquatch. They've got fur coming out all over. They're giants, but yeah, exactly. There's, there's so much change that takes place in the three years of middle school, and it leads to a lot of challenges. There's you know, physical change, emotional change, cognitive change, social change. Um, you know, at the same time, there's a lot of pressures. There's uh, certainly, I, I kind of feel like I'm in a building where students are um, kind of feeling like the spotlight is on them all the time. And, and by the way, I'm, I'm Kevin Wisniewski. I'm over at Tower Heights. Uh, we end up, we have uh, 1,875 uh, middle schoolers that we get to serve um, across the three buildings. Um, we have uh, Arlene Petty over at Watts with uh, Kate Campbell. By the way, Arlene would like to say a big thank you to our board and to our administration. Um, Arlene, for the last few years, last several years, has been working with 735 middle schoolers all by herself. And uh, this year we got some support with uh, Kate Campbell joining the team over there. Um, so that is that is huge. It's a, it's a huge help for her. Um, uh, I'm at Tower Heights. I've got about 560 students. And Mr. Rings is over at Magzig up the road with about 580 students. Um, but again, we, you know, we're, we're working with this population, which is to be in middle school, you have to love middle school. You have to love things being awkward and goofy and things just kind of being strange sometimes. And that's okay. That's, that's, that's perfectly okay. Um, but I do feel like there, there certainly are some unique challenges that our young people are walking through. Um, for a lot of them, some of those challenges are internal. Some of those are external. Some of those are very much related to technology. Um, and you know, one of the things that I love about what I get to do is that each day I get to have young, I get to have conversations with young people and just of helping to coach, helping to guide, helping to give them some direction, helping just sometimes just to listen um, when they don't know where to go with things. Um, that's probably one of my favorite things about what I get to do on a daily basis. Uh, there's a lot of different things as you can see here in terms of ways that we look to help support, you know, empower uh, our students uh, as well as challenge them. Uh, helping them to become independent learners. Because by the time they leave us and are heading up here to the high school, our goal is that they are, that they're independent learners. Um, but it, it, it gets a little messy sometimes along the way, and that's okay. Um, you know, some of the things I, I, I think of um, that we do to kind of help support them. Certainly, you know, a lot of uh, similar things to our, our elementary friends. It just kind of gets a little bit different at the middle school level. Uh, a couple of things I think of, uh, we get to um, have study buddies. So this is a great little thing we do after school. Um, I help coordinate where we have high schoolers who are part of our National Honor Society come on over and tutor our middle schoolers who need some extra help. It, it's a great connection. I love the fact, well, being here at Tower, we get a lot of folks who just, a lot of our high schoolers who can just walk on over after school and come join us. Uh, that's just one little way that I think of how we help uh, connect students and help support students as well. Um, I think of some of the things we do building wide because uh, we get to do, not only do I get to work with kids individually, but I think of things that we do holistically as well um, from our PBIS programming where we're looking at, at Tower Heights, we call it Tower Heights Cares. And we're looking at uh, activities we do through our advisory programming, uh, things that we do uh, across our building to help uh, build positive citizenship. Uh, accountability, respect, empathy, those, those so important skills that our, our students need to continue to, to develop throughout life. Um, you know, one of the things I also, I get the opportunity to work with is a, is a group called our Hello Leaders. And it is this group of eighth graders in our building who, um, I, I'm really proud of this group this year because there's about 25% of our eighth graders are a part of this team. And their t this team is there to help foster community within our building. Um, they have taken on some roles where they're mentoring sixth graders. Uh, they're planning a, a mental wellness awareness week. 
uh, we're going to be bringing in Dr. Brian Ciccarelli, and, and we've got some things that uh, we're going to be working with, um, you know, and bringing in community resources and things. But this is, it's a fantastic group, and one of the things I love is that we hit this age, and they can take on that leadership role. Um, where they're feeling empowered to help make a difference within our building as well. So that's just a little bit about middle school. Thank you. Okay, well, good evening. My name is Beth Buck. I'm one of the South Unit counselors here at Centerville High School. Um, so at CHS, all of our students are assigned to either the South, East, or West unit. And within each unit, we have two school counselors which means there's about 430 students that each unit counselor is overseeing. Our job as school counselors is to support our kids academically, personally, socially, and with their post high school plans. As you can imagine, this may include many different conversations and tasks throughout the day. Counselors have an open door policy where kids can drop into the office or make appointments to see us. We do meet with all of our students at least once a year um, in a group setting their ninth and 10th grade year and then with individual meetings their 11th and 12th grade year. A high school counselor's day may start with a meeting with a student about scheduling and maybe um, helping them select some classes that align with their career goals and then quickly move on to talking to another student who struggles with overwhelming anxiety and maybe they don't even feel comfortable showing up to school in the first place. We collaborate with teachers, principals, parents, and other com community organizations. Our job requires active listening, problem solving, and solution focused work. We meet kids where they are, and we encourage them to develop resiliency and take action in creating meaningful and purposeful lives. Um, school counselors are monitoring high school credits, Ohio State testing, and diploma seals, but also if a student has enough food the required school supplies or clothes and hygiene essentials. High school counselors are there to help teenagers navigate both their academic journey and their personal development. The work can be emotional and unpredictable, but also ins inspirational and rewarding. The best part of my job is getting to know kids and hearing them speak from the heart. One of my roles is to serve as an advisor for our Elk Connectors, which is a senior only group of about 100 kids, and they mentor ninth graders throughout their first year at the high school. We, re we recently finished up our annual tug of war competition, um, which the purpose is to encourage team building and unity within the advisory, but it also involves some awkwardness, a lot of laughs and a competitive spirit. My other favorite role is serving as an advisor for Hope Squad, which I know Amy's gonna talk about a bit. Um, Hope Squad is a suicide prevention group of about 50 students um, who are nominated by their peers. And it has a goal of increasing mental health awareness and a positive school culture. And hearing these kids talk about supporting other kids with their overall well-being is one of the most rewarding experiences. So overall, the high school unit counselors do play an important role in helping kids navigate the challenges of adolescence, make informed decisions about their future, and develop the necessary skills to be successful in high school and beyond. Hi, I'm Amy Hilliard, and I'm one of the intervention counselors at Centerville High School. So there's two of us, Beth Myers, is my partner and our job really is to support the unit counselors and work with students that are really struggling with mental health issues, social emotional issues, um, anything like that, family issues, um, managing stress, alcohol and drug use, um, relationships, anxiety, depression. Um, we work with those students and connect with the unit counselors, principals, teachers, parents, and link those families with community resources as they need them. Um, the collaboration is really key. We all are working together for what's best for the student because we want those students to be successful. Um, and I'd say that is pretty much the most important thing is that we're all working together. Um, another awesome part of my job is the prevention piece. And so Beth and I are advisors on some of some, some really cool programs that we have at the high school. Um, Hope Squad, like Beth Buck just talked about, um, the suicide prevention program. We have some really awesome kids that really want to make a difference in our school. Um, <clears throat> we also are advisors for Bold, Building Our Lives Drug and Alcohol Free. These students want to work with middle schoolers and talk about the dangers of 
that lifestyle. And so they go into health classes at the middle schools and we work with them and train them. Um, they want to do activities here at the high school. They want to make a big difference. They think this is really important that we have a safe and drug-free school. Um, we also do some mentoring programs with elementaries. Lunch Buddies is one that's up and running. Um, we also do Care Team. That's a mentoring program with Klein Elementary and our high schoolers and their fifth graders. Um, also Elk Connectors, our seniors mentoring our freshmen. So our kids want to make a difference and they want it to matter that they were here. And so they come to school every day wanting to do those opportunities. And so we spend a lot of our time trying to help coordinate and facilitate those things for them. Good evening. My name is Marion Delator, and um, I work in the career ed office here at the high school. I also serve as a guidance department chair. I wanted to congratulate Kim. And Kim, before I became a guidance counselor, I taught biology for 20 years. My students are very thankful that I did not sing Hunter Square. <laughs> <Square. laughs> but I, I enjoyed that. So I just want to point out just a few of the opportunities that are available here to our students through career ed. Obviously, Centerville High School is a comprehensive high school. We strive to offer, uh, offer opportunities for all students. So specifically through career ed, we currently have 20 programs and our juniors and seniors are eligible to apply for these programs. 13 of the programs are here on our campus and then uh, an additional seven programs are at Fairmont High School we partner with Fairmont and Oakwood City Schools as well. We provide transportation to Fairmont if our students need transportation. We think career ed is a great opportunity for students because not only does it expose them to the academic aspects, but it also exposes them to the hands-on practical aspects of the career. Um, many of our career programs have internships built in and again, we, we think it's a win-win for our students. And I'm thankful to be able to work in career ed, and I'm thankful, thankful for, for being able to work with the students here. Um, I don't want to throw a lot of numbers out to you, and honestly, I'm really regretting the fact that I chose small font right now. <laughs> but we, we do have 506 students to participate in our junior and senior programs, which is equal to about 33% of our students. And again, we, th we think that's, that's really good. We're proud of that. 99% um, of the students qualify for the Tech Prep Scholarship. Not necessarily do all students use that scholarship, but it is, it is there for them if they choose. The state of Ohio requires that we do these follow-up surveys with any student that completed our career ed programs. So I have some numbers for you for the class of 22 follow-up survey. And you can see, and again, we're very proud of this one, 96% of career ed students who graduated from Centerville either attended a two or a four year college or university after graduation, or they enlisted in the military, or they um, completed or at least participated in an internship. So again, we think those are win-win scenarios. In addition to the career ed programs, I'd like to throw a little advertisement out but our annual college career fair is coming up. It's right around the corner. It's a week from tomorrow. So it's March 5th. All students and, and families are invited and encouraged to attend. We were working on the list today, and right now I believe we have 70 or 72 um, representatives from 72 colleges that will be participating, and we have about 80 career representatives. And the career representatives are, some of those um, are professional careers, a lot are in the health sciences, but we also have a great deal of skilled trades representatives coming in. So we do think there's something here for everybody at our, our college career fair. It's still one of the largest college fairs hosted by a high school in the state of Ohio. Um, our career ed students and our College Credit Plus students have access to a Sinclair counselor. So we, we reached out to Sinclair and they send a counselor here twice a month to meet with, again, career ed students or CCP students. And they work with those students and can help them understand how the credits that they're 
earning at Centerville can uh, matriculate to Sinclair or also um, to one of our four-year Ohio colleges. And the last bullet point, I am very proud of the relationship that we have with our local military recruiters. So our recruiters are allowed to visit our high school at least once per month. And they come in during the two lunch periods and they set up a table in the back of Central and they can meet with any students who are interested in meeting with them. We also have, in the fall, we run a pretty large, what we title the Military Expo, and it's just another opportunity for our students to hear about um, opportunities for them if they want to go military. And at the Expo, it's not just info on enlisting. We bring in ROTC representatives. Uh, we bring in, every so often, we're having academy grad that are come back and speak. In the last couple of years, we've heard, we've had representatives from the Coast Guard. So again, I'm I'm very proud of that. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Andrea Fleischman. I'm a programs coordinating counselor at Centerville High School, which is a new role at the high school this year. I was a unit counselor for six years, um, and then this uh, role was created. You've heard a lot about the numbers and the need, um, social, emotionally. Everything seems to be growing. The amount of things to keep track of to get a diploma in Ohio <laughs> is growing. Just a lot, a lot of things to keep track of. And so, um, my let me click this real quick. My role includes some of the programs um, that students are interested in and can be a part of, and. Um, 504s are, you know, special programs that students need support um, to have. And, and so this is a supportive role to the unit counselors while the unit counselors are um, keeping track of, of their day to day. I'm able to work with students in these groups to support them um, and get them what they need and really take time to, to make sure they're all set up. So um, College Credit Plus is one of the programs um, run through the counseling department at the high school. And so one of my hats is College Credit Plus coordinator actually for the district. I help middle school students as well since this is a mandated um, required program for all public schools to offer in grades 7 through 12. Um, this program allows students to take a limited number of college courses at no cost to the family. This school year, um, 492 students are taking at least one college course. Um, through CCP, which is up from last year's number of 425. And as of now, well, as of Friday, 505 students have stated their intent to participate in the College Credit Plus program next school year with a deadline of April 1st to let us know. And so um, there's a lot that goes with this, including sending records and communicating with colleges. Um, there's an application process that students have to go through with the college of their choice. Um, there's a lot of record sending back and forth, um, me sending their academic information to the colleges, colleges sending registration reports and grade reports to us to make sure those classes count for graduation and, and I, you know, make sure they're all accurately transcribed on our documents here at the high school, um, counting up credits that, that these courses and grades impact the GPA and so there are, there's a lot of attention to detail and making sure things are right do and documented properly and um, things change a lot. Students drop classes, students, um, unfortunately, some of them can fail classes and um, things like that. They can choose new classes, you know, and so there's a lot of, of keeping track of that. And so I, I like taking my time to work with students and, you know, not just transcribing the, the documents and the records, but, you know, teaching them how to communicate in a college world. Like, this is what you have to do. You have to check your inbox when you're a college student and a lot of high school students don't even know that they have a college email account and they don't use their school email very often so it's walking them through like hey you've got to reach out to your professor during their office hours if you need help with something um, one thing that i'm passionate about is access to education and i feel really lucky to be able to to help students and prepare them for what they're going to see in the future um, if they're if they're college ready at this time you know and, and doing this a little early um, another role that I have is a 504 coordinator for the high school. Um, so, you know, 504s have an entire set of accommodations like, like was mentioned in the earlier grades. They're customized to each student, so every plan looks different. 
um, which is uh, sometimes a lot to keep track of. By law, schools must follow specific guidelines for implementing, reviewing, and supporting students who have documented disabilities that impact a daily, you know, some sort of daily functioning, and in this case, um, what's needed to be successful in school. Currently, there are 285 students on a 504 plan at the high school, and every single plan must be reviewed annually. So I sit down with students and go through their plan, make sure they know what they have access to, and then communicate all of that with teachers and update the unit counselors as well so that everybody's on the same page. Um, another role that I have at the high school is running um, some tests where I... Um, an approved testing location for the national ACT and SAT. And so we host two of those tests each school year, along with a local uh, PSAT, the practice SAT, um, to students in grades nine through 11. Each year, about 700 of our students take advantage of this opportunity to prepare for this part of college applications without leaving their community. Thank you. Just to finish up, I uh, just want to say thank you for inviting us to come. We're, we're, we're a very passionate group. We probably could talk all night about what we do because we, we love what we do. Um, but again, one of the things I think of is that we, we're advocating for our profession. We're also advocating for our students and that our students have access to good, high-quality school counseling services because we know how important that is. And we, <coughs> these folks and our colleagues, um, are on the front lines each and every day, seeing the rising needs uh, of our community, of our students, of our families, and you know, doing everything within our ability to, to help each and every member of our, of our community. And again, you know, I just I appreciate your support, appreciate the support of the board, our administration, and of course, our community as well. But just to, uh, from all the school counselors, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. I just want to take a, take a second to, I think from this board and from me also, just to thank you all. I, I think we started to hearing the community how we've got too many staff, we have too many counselors, you know, we don't need this many people. I just, I was sitting here while you're talking, just running some numbers to give you an idea, and I just, I know you gave some numbers, but um, at the PVN, PBS level, we have one counselor for 718 students. In the elementary, one counselor for every 610 students. Middle school, one for every 600, uh, every 469. And at the high school, one for every 450. District-wide, we have one counselor for every 530 students. This is a time when things are getting more issues with mental health, with wellness. Um, our intervention counselors, which deal with a lot of the emotional mental health issues in most severe cases, there's one for every 1,350 high school students. So for those, to those who think that we have too many counselors and that we're overstaffed, uh, I just simply say you're wrong. You're wrong. We don't have enough is what we don't have. Because as they stated before, the, the mental health issues and the problems with students these days is skyrocketing. Um, so, you know, from, a, from, from someone who's in medicine and seeing it on a daily basis, um, you guys are more than needed and much more appreciated than you, you know you are. So thank you. Thank you. Um. Okay. So thank you. Appreciate uh, our counselors. I know some of them have some activities they have to get to. So uh, I will say you're excused uh, for the CD if you want to go. Uh, our last honors tonight. It's exciting to have Representative Tom Young here. Uh, he's going to do a uh, brief presentation to honor. Uh, one of our school board members. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, if it's okay and you'll oblige me, I'd like to read the entire commendation if that's okay. Well, you're here, right? And this is to honor you. On behalf of the members of the House of Representatives of the 135th General Assembly of Ohio, we are pleased to extend special, special recognition to Jeff Schwarzer on your distinguished service to the Centerville City Schools Board of Education. You have been a tireless advocate for the Centerville City School Board of Education over the years, and you have worked diligently to ensure the area students receive consistent and quality instruction. During your tenure, 
you have demonstrated a deep concern for the well-being of the community, and your expertise, insight, and ability have certainly helped the district achieve academic and fiscal excellence. To your credit, you have helped realize great progress and success throughout the community, and you have gained the esteem of your colleagues, your community, and most importantly, the students whose lives you have impacted. Indeed, your efforts on behalf of the Centerville City Schools Board of, uh, Board of Education have enhanced the quality of life for many, and you have demonstrated how very much a conscientious, industrious person can accomplish. Thus, it is with sincere pride that we pay tribute to you on your exemplary service to Centerville City Schools Board of Education and look to a future that reflects your significant contributions. Wow. Wow. Uh, again, uh, and I promise I'm not going to be as emotional tonight as I was a couple of months ago. But certainly uh, something like this does not happen in a vacuum. But it ha certainly happens with the support of the community, the support of every school employee that we've had since I've been on the board and the support of every administration person past and present and certainly the support of all of my fellow school board members past and present as well. Uh, I'm overwhelmed um, but Thank you all very much. Have a good year, too. Okay. Congratulations. All right. Next up is public participation. <clears throat> the Board of Education recognizes the value to school governance of public comment on educational issues and the importance of allowing members of the public to express themselves on school matters of community interest. The presiding officer of each board meeting at which public participation is permitted shall administer the following rules of the board. Portion of the meeting for public participation shall be limited to 30 minutes. Attendees must, must register their intention in advance, which they have. Uh, individuals may not register others to speak and no participant may speak more than once. Uh, participants will first be recognized and then requested to preface their comments by an announcement of their name and whether the participant is a resident or non-resident, and if appropriate, a group affiliation. Each statement made shall be limited to three minutes or less. Board will listen to all who speak, but generally not engage in discussion or dialogue at this time. Matters requiring follow-up will be directed to the superintendent. We have four speakers signed up. Uh, Mr. Daly. Thank you, this is Turnbull. <clears throat> I am Bob Daly. I live at 8433 Moundview Circle at St. Leonard. I am here to speak in favor of the school levy. But first, to put my remarks in perspective requires a bit of background. In 1957, I was a young reporter for the Dayton Journal Herald. My first assignment was to cover Centerville and Washington Township in the south suburbs. There was no city hall or the township government center then. The high school was on West Franklin, across the street from the Wishing Well, the site of our community's first high school. There was no Centerville, Washington Park District. The Americana had not been thought of. My wife and I, along with our two children, <clears throat> moved to Centerville and Washington Township in 1977. Benham's Grove was so overgrown, you couldn't see what was back there. City Hall and the township's government center had been built. The park district was on its way to 50 sites. Two library buildings were on the horizon in this rapidly growing suburb. Stubbs Park and the rec center came online. Americana had replaced the ox roast. So where are we today in the development of our magnificent community? The township has recently dedicated a new fire station right next door, and is dredging the ponds at the rec center. Centerville's uptown is booming. Stubbs Park is being updated, and Benham's Grove 
is expanding. Everything in our community seems to be coming up roses. But what is missing is the educational well-being of our most precious treasure, our children and grandchildren. Because the November school levy was defeated, the March levy has been reduced and will provide less. Already, programs have been cut, and more reductions will come if the levy is defeated. How can that be? Don't we all want a better life for our children and grandchildren? In 1796, many thousands of people have built this community that we call home. Thousands of administrators and teachers have gone before us and created this five-car Centerville schools that we have. It's up to us to keep the schools running at full speed. And the best way for us to do that is to vote yes on the school levy. We will be further engaged in get educating our children and grandchildren so that their lives will be as enriched as they possibly can. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Ms. Schultz. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am Allison Schultz, a sophomore here at Centerville High School, and I speak in favor for the March 2024 20, levy. For starters, allow me to share my personal experience with first-year first teacher, Mr. Lawson. Mr. Lawson is my geometry teacher who greets my peers and I every day with a friendly smile and a simple fist bump. He is a math teacher who stays relatable and makes math fun for everyone. Mr. Lawson is one of the best teachers I've had in my entire schooling career. He, he ensures that everyone learns the material and enjoys math all at the same time. While this is every teacher's job, I can confidently say that we've all had one teacher that shows, up, shows us the love, support, and care more than most. My first question to all of you is this. Given the knowledge that aspiring teachers like Mr. Lawson will lose their jobs if the levy, pass, if the levy does not pass, why vote no? Not only this, but the result of an unsuccessful levy will lower the amount of paraprofessionals and teachers among our school districts. By this, I'd like to remind and or inform you that, that all that this will increase class sizes which, sizes which snowballs into larger, more problematic bumps in the road, such as stressed teachers, less one-on-one -on -one time, more distractions, and overall displeasure for students, teachers, parents, paraprofessionals, and, all, and everyone else. In continuation, these issues with staffing put a concerning toll on our disabled community. Mr. Darrell, a special education teacher here at the high school, states that the current ratio of paraprofessionals, also known as aides, to students with disabilities is currently 9 to 14. He goes on to say this ratio is only to worsen if the March levy fails, given the community as low as a 6 to 14 ratio instead. The disabled community needs a strong, stable foundation for their future. With the, school with the school already struggling, why would you punish kids who need the support to improve? Let me ask you a deeper question. Would you rather send children to school ready and excited to learn or create more difficulties for the disabled community? We are raised around adults who complain about society, politics, and social media influence on today's youth. However, the same people have deemed it acceptable to forget about the children's education and ignore the needs of schools. You want, you want us off our phones. You want us to pay attention, attend, and want to attend school. If you want us to succeed, strive, and believe in a world where hope seems like a lie, then show us the way. Help, us, help the community guide us to a better, brighter future. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Strife? My name is Jason Strife. Uh, I live at uh, 266 Cardigan Road. Um, I moved there in uh, 2009. I now have three kids, two middle school kids, and a third grader. Um, one reason we moved to Centerville was the small class sizes. Um, as an educator myself, I've experienced classroom sizes of 33 kids per class, fifth graders. Um, that's a large amount of kids. So one reason that we came to Centerville was smaller class sizes. Um, my kids have flourished with Centerville. Um, that's small class sizes, that one-on-one -on -one attention. Um, 
And then, of all things, experiencing as an educator, and then tonight, we have the counselors here. Um, the MTSS process, identifying uh, kids who need that extra help. Now, smaller class sizes, you can have that ability to hit those uh, MTSS uh, policy things and getting those kids the need they need. You have a classroom of 30 or more, it's gonna take more time. So that's, that's some of the effects when you lose and the levy fails. Um, additionally, um, art, music, what's gonna happen with that? You have a big um, effects from those things as well. So um, pretty much what I'm saying is we need to pass this levy. $11.40 for 100,000 is not that much um, in the scheme of things. And uh, so there's my soapbox, thank you. Um, and Mr. Wilson. Uh, good evening. My name is Doyle Wilson. I live at 9909 Sheehan Road. I've been a Centerville resident for almost 40 years. I've had two children graduate. One, gra one grandchild graduated last year, and I have four more in the system. Two middle school and two high school. They all have different needs, different abilities, and different interests. I feel as if all seven of my grandkids had benefited not only academically, but with extracurricular activities offered through the fine arts, athletic departments. They've been involved in marching band, winter guard, the co-ed dance team, bowling, golf, and softball, just to name a few. I will be forever grateful for the opportunities my family has had through the years in Centerville. I strongly support this levy because I want, I want current and future families to have the same quality education opportunities that my family has had. I feel it's critical for our community to support this levy so that we can avoid having all additional cuts that will be made if the levy does not pass. I feel that quality schools quality community they go hand in hand thank you for everything we have done for my family and i wish you nothing but a continued success as a district thank you thank you very much all right uh, moving on to board and administrative reports first up is the legislative report with mrs sparks thank you the House Ways and Means Committee accepted a substitute version of House Bill 263, which would authorize a property tax freeze for certain owner-occupied homes. The substitute version makes the following changes to the bill. The age to qualify is reduced from 70 to at least 65 years old. The continual occupancy requirement is reduced from 10 years to just two years. The total annual income to, justify, or to qualify is reduced from 70000 to 50000 or less. The home value necessary to qualify is reduced to less than 500000 The requirement in the previous version was that the home would be less than $1 million. Two new bills that have been proposed in the House, one is House Bill 407, which requires chartered non-public schools that participate in certain scholarship programs to report students' performance to the Department of Education and Workforce to be compared to the other schools located in that school district and make that da da data publicly accessible on the website. And then House Bill 411 would increase the base teacher salary to $50,000. This afternoon, jo Jocelyn Spencer Reinhardt and I had a great meeting with Senator Vance's office. They seem to be very interested in working with both of us and would like, to, like us to share our thoughts on upcoming legislative matters. It was a great promising meeting. And then earlier this month, I met with Senator Brown's new staff member. The purpose of this meeting was just to meet and start building a working relationship. He too was very excited about working with me and learning more about our district. And that is the end of the report. Thank you. Um, student board reps.
Hi everyone, my name is Ashita Mantri. Um, I am a senior student board rep and I'm going to be talking about something we do called Candy and Comments. Every month we host something called Candy and Comments where we set up a table in the back of Central, um, which is a very common gathering place for students and they can fill out a survey for a piece of candy. Um, our surveys, the two surveys that we've done so far have been on their thoughts and feelings on Centerville High School and Centerville as a community, and the other one was more focused on kindness and empathy. So um, last, well, this month, we um, had both of those surveys out on the table, and the results we got were, um, there were a lot of concerns about the levy amongst children, um, or amongst kids. Um, they were also very concerned about how people were demonstrating kindness towards others in school, which is why we've been focusing on kindness and empathy and are planning to do a segment on that in a Friday Focus coming up. Um, they were also con concerned about safety. All of these have been consistent concerns that we've seen in the past months as well. Um, so we're working on measures to combat these concerns and our plan for next month is to come up with a new survey so that we can get some new ideas um, to work with. Hi, my name is Kate Wallace. I'm also a senior student board rep. Um, in addition to the things that Ashita discussed, we are also continuing to pursue our project concerning reintegrating club sports that are not currently recognized for PE credit into state legislation. Um, we've been fortunate enough to have several meetings over the course of the last couple weeks to um, further this project. Uh, we had a meeting with Mr. Carroll, as well as we were fortunate enough to have a meeting with uh, State Representative Tom Young, um, <clears throat> as well as a round table, including student reps from West Carrollton, Valley View, Northmont, and Miamisburg. Um, Two main ideas that we discussed with these, in these meetings are furthering research on the legislation that may have already set a precedent for this club sports uh, issue, as well as um, considering all perspectives, include, most specifically including the perspectives of health and PE staff, um, what they may be, uh, be able to offer to this concern that we have. Hi, I'm Thomas Garcia. I'm a senior board rep. We've also are about to start contacting school counselors across our district and also the other districts that we are working with to see their own school policies and how they're affected by uh, club sports. We're also going to start serving other students around each district to gather their input and see how they would be affected. That's the end of our report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next up is Ms. Sauber and the financial report, and Mr. Wesney, I believe. Good evening, everyone. A lot of the information uh, that you're going to hear tonight are things that we've been talking about at our community forums, uh, past board meetings uh, for pretty much the last six months. But I want to start um, by reminding everyone that this presentation is merely factual. Uh, the district personnel are not allowed to advocate for or against a levy uh, during times in which we're being compensated by the district. Uh, so are we on? Uh, to start this evening, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about School Funding 101. Um, Mr. Wesney then is going to talk about district expenses, and I'm going to wrap up with uh, levy facts. Um, we've had two community forums uh, in, the, in the last few weeks that each had about close to 100 people there where we've been able to educate people about district finances and talk about school funding. Um, Mr. Young was at last week's uh, meeting, which we appreciate uh, him being there to uh, listen to our story. Um, and so we want to talk a little bit tonight and just recap a little bit of that information. So um, school funding in Ohio is very complicated. Uh, we receive some state money and the majority of our uh, revenue comes uh, from property taxes. Uh, that percentage that comes from property taxes is about 77%. Uh, we receive about 12% in state aid, which is the school's uh, uh, funding formula. Um, that percentage for Centerville is low uh, because we are a high wealth district. Uh, I, I talked a lot about 
that at our January board meeting. I encourage people to go back and watch that recording if they're interested in, um, in listening to that. I also talked at that board meeting in great detail also about the state law that freezes how much revenue that we can receive from uh, voted levies that have been passed in prior years. Uh, that House Bill 920 uh, was enacted in 1976. It's longstanding legislation in Ohio um, and, and is how uh, all levies work. And that's levies, whether it's a school levy, whether it's a township levy, uh, cities, parks, uh, any levy is uh, impacted by House Bill 920. And that legislation really is in place so that when uh, taxpayers experience large increases, like we just recently had in Montgomery County, it does protect homeowners from seeing proportionate uh, increases in their tax bill. And again, I did talk a lot about that at, at the January board meeting that um, uh, individuals can go back and, and watch. But what I want to, I guess, just stress is uh, here tonight is that when property values go up, we do receive a, a little bit of additional money from inside millage. Um, that's factored into our financial projections, which are filed with the Ohio Department of Education. Um, but the rest of that 77% uh, stays relatively flat because when, it, when property values go up, the effective rates of voted levies goes down. Um, and we do have a table here that shows the impact uh, of voted levies. These are three parcels of property that uh, are, are in our district. Uh, each one had a value increase, but they vary from 52%, 31%, and 17%. So everybody, all three of these individuals saw an increase, but on the voted levies, um, the person with the highest uh, percent increase in value did see a tax increase uh, because they went up more than the average in the district. Um, the taxpayer B, who went up very close to the same as, um, as the average, their uh, tax that they're paying on the voted levies is virtually the same. Uh, taxpayer C, their tax bill went down. And so as a district, it's, it's easy for me to stand here and say that we don't receive um, additional uh, revenue on those voted levies because we don't. But everyone's individual uh, position or, or uh, piece of the pie, so to speak, is impacted based on what their personal value did because not everyone's value is going up at the same rate. We do have to file the five-year forecast uh, with the Ohio Department of Education twice a year. Uh, you, you board approved this, uh, the numbers that are up on the screen, you board approved that back in November. Um, to date, those numbers are, are, very, are pretty close to the same. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of fluctuation yet, uh, and we will file a revision in May um, based on changes that may or may not happen. Uh, you know, Mr. Wesney is going to probably mention reductions and things that we put in place for this year. That will impact that a little bit. And obviously, the uh, outcome of issue 18 uh, may or may not change the revenue uh, piece of the five-year forecast. Um, but it, again, the, the red circle there, the surplus and deficit line, is the, is the important part of the five-year forecast. And it's what we use as, as administrators and what, I, uh, what we bring to you as board members to talk about when we have to be back on the ballot. After you pass a levy, which we did back in 2019, that's the last additional uh, uh, increase in, in revenue that we had. Um, what typically happens is revenues exceed the expenses for hopefully a couple of years. And, and in 2021 and in 2022, that happened where we were able to add to uh, our cash balance. But then in 2023, our expenses started to exceed revenue and we started to deficit spend. And that trend continues until we either increase our revenue, which is in the form of a levy, and or <laughs> decrease our expenses. So those are our two options. We have to address that red line. Uh, we have to address that, and we can do that through revenue increase or uh, expenditure decreases. So good evening. Uh, my job tonight is really to kind of go back and talk about district expenses and really the levy uh, in which uh, we'll be back on the March 24 ballot uh, for more operating funds. 
and really specifically share again with you and the community uh, how we'll use those funds and what those funds will be used for uh, in the future. So with district expenses, um, really looking at maintaining our educational programs. Uh, the primary need uh, for additional funding is to maintain quality of ed educational programming and services. Uh, this requires obviously uh, staffing uh, our schools appropriately and maintaining reasonable class sizes, uh, training our staff, and buying curriculum materials and classroom supplies uh, and needed for our staff. It's also looking at um, the health and wellness. We heard that this evening from, from all of our guidance counselors. Uh, it's preventing or providing that students' mental health uh, affects their educational experience and their academic achievement. Obviously, we want our kids to feel comfortable and safe uh, within our buildings, and all those things are important. Uh, we provide those support measures for our students and families as they navigate um, some of those tough social emotional challenges, uh, which can impact obviously their academic performance. And in some of these cases can impact um, their, their security or school safety as well. Uh, in addition to classroom teachers, uh, this support is provided by uh, school counselors, uh, as we talked about tonight, uh, our nurses, our school psychs, our principals, and our school resource officers. Uh, expanding college and career pathways. Um, we need to continue to look at our college and career pathways to prepare our graduates uh, to be responsible members uh, of our community. And tonight, um, I'm excited to announce, and I shared this at our work session, that Mr. Trello uh, tonight will be talking about um, our AP, our career education uh, programs, and our College Credit Plus uh, programs as well. Uh, providing the co-curricular and extracurricular activities are also important for our students. Uh, to provide that well-rounded education. Uh, it's, it's every year in the spring. I hear a lot of our parents talk about um, and our students talk about all the opportunities that they had uh, while being at Central High School or the Centerville City Schools. Uh, we tend to go above and beyond to provide the best educational programming as possible for our students. Uh, additionally, with district expenses, um, it's really looking about or looking at retaining and recruiting high-quality teachers. Uh, as with any school district, the majority of the district's budget uh, is spent on salaries and benefits for all staff. Uh, every year we work very hard to make sure that we appropriately staff uh, uh, classrooms and have students or teachers staffed across the district appropriately based upon student needs and enrollment. Um, part of this additional funding in this district expenses is looking at uh, supporting facility maintenance uh, in our daily operations. Uh, and renovation of projects. Uh, we're also dealing with aging facilities. We've talked about a lot throughout the last year. Uh, average age of our buildings uh, are about 60 years old now. Magazine's 100 years old. Uh, although the levy in March ballot is earmarked for operating funds uh, and, or operating expenses, we can still use some of those funds to offset costs for equipment and some of those uh, facility needs that may need to take place. Maintaining our infrastructure uh, and equipment, I just mentioned uh, some of our equipment needs. Uh, our operating funds are also used um, for all our materials that keep our district uh, where it needs to be on a daily basis. Um, that includes a lot of things that you don't necessarily see all the time, such as our utilities, our trash, recycling that we have, bus fuel, paper, copiers, some of our services that we need uh, for our daily operations are all part of uh, our district expenses and why we're asking for the additional operating funds. Uh, keeping up with inflation, I know Mr. Sauber talked a little bit about that already. Um, the state funding remains relatively flat from year to year, uh, but the additional requirements uh, from the state uh, are added to the district's plate, uh, which are some unfunded mandates that we have to continue to provide uh, you know, money or support uh, for our students as, as we move forward. Uh, this next slide, uh, looking forward, is looking at our phase reduction plan. Uh, as you know, we've talked about a two-phase reduction plan um, really since last November. Uh, looking at the March levy as a reduced ask on the ballot, uh, in which the November uh, uh, request failed. Uh, we've also been looking at reductions in, in all areas of our operations. So phase one uh, that you see here is really concentrating on uh, our reductions in retirements and resignations. Uh, you can see it's about 10 and a half positions, uh, about $1.27 million in that first phase. Uh, if we're not successful uh, in March, we'll have to look at the second phase uh, of our reduction plan. Uh, there'll be an additional uh, 
10 point, or I'm sorry, additional 16 uh, positions uh, with our classified staff, uh, which comes out to about a total of 26.5 positions uh, just in our classified staff and about 14.75 in our certificated staff. Um, so obviously with our reductions, we're trying the best we can to minimize the impact on our classrooms. Uh, that's where um, obviously is an important part of what we do each and every day. Uh, so we're looking at those reductions really all across uh, the district and all parts of our operation. So we want to end uh, by just sharing a, a few of the levy facts. Uh, March 19th, 2024 is the primary uh, uh, election. Uh, issue 18 is the 3.9 mil uh, levy that um, Centerville Schools has on the ballot for operating expenses. It will raise $11.2 million annually if it is passed and the cost um, per month to a $100,000 home value as appraised by the Montgomery County Auditor is about $11.40 um, uh, per month. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we did have, uh, we've had two community forums, uh, one in January, one last week, and we have another one scheduled for March 13th at Tower Heights Middle School. Um, those forums are an opportunity for Mr. Wesney and I to share factual information about the district's finances. Um, I think we've had good turnout. I think we've had good feedback from those and a lot uh, of appreciation um, for, for being there to share that information. Almost every day I am getting requests, uh, just questions and, and requests for information. I know Mrs. Swan gets a lot. Probably everybody in the front row here is, is getting uh, questions. I know that you as board members are getting questions as well. We have a lot of information out um, on our webpage. It's all factual information, um, and that's at centerville.k12.oh.us slash levy. Um, we continue to update that as we get questions. So especially if we see a theme in, in particular questions, we try to uh, update that um, as well. So that is what we have for this evening, unless you have questions. Right. Thank you. All right, uh, next up, Mr. Trello. Good evening. Well, as excited as Mr. Wesney was to announce, and I'm equally as excited to share this uh, presentation with you tonight. Um, I'm here tonight to talk about our high school program, specifically. Uh, a handful that we offer. Um, <clears throat> as an administrative team, we felt like uh, discussing these programs with the board and the community uh, was, was somewhat timely in that uh, some of the information, or there's been a lot of questions in the community about these programs. And so my goal tonight is to just give a super brief history on each one of these programs, talk about why we offer them, talk about the benefits for families and students, and then also talk about some of the, the, the financial uh, implications for the district. So specifically tonight, I wanna to talk about College Credit Plus, um, Advanced Placement Programming, also known as AP, uh, probably more commonly known as AP Programming, and then lastly, our career education or career technical education offered at Centerville High School. Um, so I'm gonna start uh, with College Credit Plus, and um, there's actually been a, a couple allusions to this already tonight through our counselors program, and, and Mr. Wesney, I believe, spoke uh, briefly about it. But uh, one of the first things that we need to understand about College Credit Plus was it's a relatively new program, came online in 2014, and it was voted in by, um, by the Ohio government uh, entities, by the General Assembly, and then signed off by the governor um, in 2014. Basically what College Credit Plus does is it requires schools and state colleges and universities to enter into an agreement to allow uh, students in grades seven through 12 to participate in college courses as long as they meet entrance requirements for, th for those colleges. Um, one of the major pieces of College Credit Plus that differs from its predecessor is that school districts are required to pick up all of the costs for the courses that students enroll in. So in previous iterations of this, um, used to be called dual enrollment, 
students could participate in college courses and, and uh, schools had partnerships with some of our local universities and colleges. Um, the difference there was it used to be that the, that the families would pick up the cost for those credits. Here with College Credit Plus, by law, the um, school district picks up all um, costs associated with that, the tuition, textbooks, et cetera. Um, just a couple few notes, or just a few notes on College Credit Plus. Um, there is a 30 semester credit limit per year on students, and that runs um, through the summer, and 120 credit lifetime limit. Uh, I do want to note that since this has come into law, there's no state funding that has accompanied this mandate. It, it's, it's something that the schools have picked up. Now, there may be some grants. For, for example, right now, there's a grant out there uh, that schools can apply for that help um, offset the cost of upping teacher credentials. So the teachers would be credentialed to, to um, offer courses on campus, but not directly offsetting the cost of College Credit Plus. There are some local decisions baked into the law. Um, we are not necessarily required to offer College Credit Plus courses on campus. Um, we do just need to support students who are interested in participating in College Credit Plus. As a matter of fact, um, Centerville High School offers uh, only a handful of classes, a couple um, ELA classes uh, through Wright State, uh, a couple math classes and career ed classes that are baked into some of our our um, programs. But one of the local decisions that that has to be made, and I call it a local decision, I guess it's more um, kind of a negotiation or, or you work with the um, higher ed entities, is, is what, what would credits cost? And so the state established a floor of $41 and a ceiling of 124. Um, for courses offered here at Centerville High School, uh, we, we pay the floor, um, but in some cases and in different institutions, we do pay the ceiling if students are taking um, courses. Uh, for example, we have students who take courses through the University of Cincinnati. You know, we'll play, pay the ceiling for those. And just to be clear, that's per credit hour, so a three credit course is gonna cost you three times that. Um, this year, I, uh, my numbers differ a little from Ms. Fleischman's, but that happens kind of often in our line of work because those can be fluid. But I had about 483 students were taking about 1,181 uh, CCP courses. And over the last five years, we have spent on average $140,000 per year on College Credit Plus tuition. I'm telling you right now that number will go up uh, next year. We know that already. Sure. Courses to them, right? Correct. And uh, what gets a little interesting here, right, is 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 um, you know, school is different than what it was in the past. So if students are applying and being accepted to um, Wright State or Sinclair uh, that, and, and can have transportation, they can, they can attend uh, school there. So um, you know, our job in those scenarios is to, as Ms. Fleischman talked about, is advise them and make sure that, that they're aware of, of you know, what that means and the ramifications of their programming. But we just can't tell them you can't do it. Right. If you are in grade seven and you, that is something you would like to do and qualify for, and qualify, we are then required we, by law to do. We it. are required by law right. to to support I just, them. I just think that's a good fact for people to understand when they say stop offering it to save money. Yeah. Okay. One hundred forty thousand dollars, by probably any measure, is is not a small amount of money. But I did want to share with the board and the community how this compares to similar districts and some neighboring districts. So I, I'll admit I took just a little liberty in that usually we compare to like similar districts or neighboring. I kind of lumped some of those together. But this next chart gives you an idea. This is a cost per student in grades nine through 12 for College Credit Plus and what, what we are currently reporting. And that might be a little hard to see maybe in the audience, but the yellow bar is where Centerville 
kind of ranks in a per uh, student spending uh, capacity uh, in with neighboring districts and, and similar districts. And so right now um, we're trending to, to spend about $70 per student at our high school. Um, that is, uh, the, I, I believe the average here is around $112 with the max going up as high as $200 in some schools. Um, I think the, the lowest is around $45 uh, here. But as you can see, $140,000 is clearly a, a, a good um, a amount of money, but comparatively, we are not throwing um, a, a lot uh, comparatively into College Credit Plus. And I wanna talk about that uh, uh, again, the part of the choice here um, that that Centerville High School had in 2014, and we have stuck with that, was to was to support students who want to take College Credit Plus, but not to offer so many courses here. And I'll, I'll explain that on the next slide. But again, what are the benefits? Maybe it's obvious that students can earn college credit that's transferable to any state college or university in Ohio <laughs> at no cost to the family. That's part of the agreement on the higher education side is that they have to accept that. So there are benefits and, and they're fantastic for the student and families uh, in, in many cases. Um, and, and one other benefit is that, uh, and it's challenging for the high school to, um, to manage, is that students can accelerate their, their credit completion. So typically uh, an average college course is three credits um, and that can, in a semester, if a student takes a three credit course, a semester course, they actually earn a full year of college credit. So students are accelerating um, the credits that they're earning for graduation. And so um, that can be uh, beneficial to the student. Considerations for the family. Uh, you know, one of the things with College Credit Plus is credits don't always necessarily transfer out of state. Uh, most schools will take them, but maybe as general and maybe an English class doesn't translate as an English class if you go out of state. Um, students might need to travel to take the course. We talked about that because we don't offer so many uh, on campus. Um, Ms. Fleischman alluded to this, but this is a real challenge. Students are treated as college students. When students enroll in College Credit Plus and they're taking class at Sinclair, they, uh, you know, Sinclair's not interested that you're the parent. They talk to the student as if they're a college student, which has caused problems uh, at times for, for, uh, on many fronts. Um, but one last piece is that if a student fails, uh, the, stu the family is billed um, for the course. So the school, it, it, in that situation, um, the family is billed for the course and the, and the uh, district does not take on the, the costs for that course if, it's, if they're failing. Just a couple considerations here. We have minimized the number of course offerings here. Part of that has to do with the cost associated with it. Um, we have had challenges with the acceleration of, of credit completion. Uh, credentialing of teachers can be a challenge of what we can or, or, or can't offer. And there are report card implications. I'll talk about that at the very end. But in summary, College Credit Plus has many benefits for students, but can be very costly depending on, on local decisions. We've elected to offer a few courses on campus to keep the cost down while supporting students taking CCP courses off campus. And I think that the, the chart probably speaks the most to that uh, relative to our, our peers. Mr. Trout, before yeah. you move on um, past College Credit, can you go back to the uh, variation between the the cost per credit hour the floor and the ceiling are, are I'm assuming based on the fact that we can't guide a student away from the idea of college credit plus we probably can't guide them to you know why don't you stay in house more cost effective for us similar class we have to let them take the credit where they want it is that correct yeah, I mean, uh, students and in, in, in families in that case kind of drive the ship. Right. Um, I think that'll really actually segue pretty well into the next program that, that I wanted to talk about. But, but So we don't have any control over whether a student picks a course at the floor that we offer in-house or if they choose to go to UC and whatnot. The, the student, the parent, um, the family is, is driving that ship, and we can't control our costs at all with that. 
Yeah, and, okay. and to some degree, the Institute of Higher Education, right. if the student qualifies. Okay. So, and in some cases, just like regular college, uh, certain colleges have, um, you know, different entry requirements. Sure. So sometimes that's a limiting factor. So I, I will say this, uh, that in this idea of steering, I guess, or advising, um, we have really spent a, a good amount of time focusing on advanced placement programming at Centerville High School. And just a brief history, I learned this today, uh, or preparing for this, <clears throat> that um, AP programs began in the 1950s and it was actually in response to the Cold War, there was concerns that US students were falling behind their, their uh, world, world peers. So the idea of, of advanced placement is, is not too far off from College Credit Plus. The idea is how do we provide opportunities for high school students to engage in college level curriculum in many different subject areas. Each uh, AP course that's offered anywhere um, typically is accompanied by an AP exam and it's through performance on that AP exam at the end of the course where students can earn college credit. Now that gets a little, we can get into the weeds, but uh, different colleges have different standards for earning credit. But the bottom line is most students who earn a three out of five or higher will earn credit at most colleges. Um, the difference between AP programs, a major difference for the district, uh, for AP pro and families, uh, is that the, in our current setting, families take on the cost for AP testing. Typically, that's $100 per test. <clears throat> so this is where Centerville uh, High School and our, our district has really um, put our efforts. And so we currently offer 27 AP courses at Centerville High School. That is up from 18 in 2019. So we've, we've added um, you know, nine courses uh, in, in the past five years. Um, We've been able to do this without hiring new staff. This was, this was a, a, a bit of a misconception. And I guess the simplest way of saying this, and I'll use environmental science, you know, um, you know, some students, we added environmental science, recently AP environmental science. Um, you know, there's a chance that those classes are being filled by students who would have historically taken earth science, right? So what ends up happening in a lot of cases is we've been advising students, talking to them about the advantages of AP courses, is we've had a lot of students shifting from what they would have traditionally taken to, to uh, new seats. And so in that, it's, it's a bit of a wash. It's a bit of a conservation of seats that happen throughout the, throughout the high school and, and being able to just shift from, I, I maybe would have taken a, or US history, now I'm taking AP US history, and we shift some sections over to a teacher who may take, take on those, those sections. What's important to note is that we, we have a, a strong interest in providing this type of programming to our, to our students. 90% of our CHS seniors, and that's a number that has been uh, consistent for a pretty long time, including this year, which I saw a number today was 92%, um, want to pursue a college degree. And with some of the partnerships that we've had to, to strengthen our AP programming, uh, we have shared uh, on numerous occasions, students who participate in one AP course while in high school are twice as likely to graduate from, from college. So their experience with uh, being in these courses and, and experiencing that college level um, rigor while in high school uh, translates to success down the road. Again, students can get in with college um, curriculum. They can, they can experience that. They can earn college credit that's transferable to most colleges across the United States. Um, and one of the major benefits is that it's taught, in my opinion, is, ben is, is taught by CHS staff. We have a fantastic staff here who has embraced our, our growth in AP um, programming and continues to be champions of that for us. Um, considerations for families, obviously credit is not guaranteed. You still need to um, perform well on the exam and there is $100 per exam uh, cost to the family.
what we've done in our growth, we, we, are, we are now, since 2018, we, we have, uh, I think around 2018, we had about 1,100 uh, AP tests being taken by our students. We are now up around almost 1,900. That, is, that change has represented minimal cost to the district because of the focus on AP programming. And I, I would say we, we've pitted that against College Credit Plus, honestly. Um, I do believe that AP programming, which is very solid programming, incentivizes our students to stay connected to our school, and it still supports them on their, uh, uh, on, in their desires to go to college. So, you know, just in summary with AP, uh, AP placement courses are cost-effective option for providing college-level learning opportunities at CHS. AP programs strongly support the vision for our high school still and are aligned with our strategic plan. Any questions about AP? Okay, the last thing that I wanna talk about, and this is probably um, the biggest eye-opener to me uh, as, as we prepared for this, because I, I, we had a, we believe this to some degree, but to get the actual numbers is pretty impressive. Career education, uh, career tech education at Centerville High School, first off, why do we offer it here? It is required by law that we offer career technical education to our students. Every, every public district in the state of Ohio must offer it. Many schools outsource that. So when you hear about Miami Valley Career Tech Center, which is a pretty amazing school, by the way, um, and it's all the way in the opposite corner of our county in Inglewood, um, but many schools outsource that to the CTC. In the 1970s, I believe it was before I was born. Um, Centerville City Schools decided to partner with Kettering and Oakwood to form a career technical education compact. We offer 19 programs. Mr. Delator had 20. I think he was including our advanced manufacturing, but um, 19 programs that are housed at Centerville and Fairmont High School. Some of those programs overlap, but some so meaning that we have the same program here as Kettering does also, but there are unique programs. And in those situations, what the, what the compact offers is that our, they will reserve two seats for Centerville students at the unique program. So they have like a, um, a, a firefighter program. We, we, they reserve two seats for our students. The majority of the seats go to their students, but, but we get two over there. And so uh, it's been a very strong partnership, been a great uh, thing for us. But we, we chose a while ago because of the accessibility and the proximal uh, location of the CTC in Mo Montgomery County to offer it here for our students. What are the benefits? It's accessible career technical education um, programming. We have about 500 students in it. There are scholarships available. Mr. Delator talked about that earlier. Um, there's program and workforce articulation. Students can go from these programs to four-year schools, to two-year schools, or straight into the workforce in some cases, or apprenticeships. It is a fantastic program. Um, things that students and families have to consider, in order to get the hours in, we have to block, and meaning students have to commit two periods a day to these. Um, there are limited seats, and some students start, some of our students start or end their day at Kettering High School, uh, and vice versa. We have some of their students that come with us. I need people to understand the the financial implications of the decisions that uh, uh, our leaders made in the 1970s. Because we offer career technical education, we receive $250,000 a year annually in Carl's Perkins grants. That doesn't completely offset the cost of our programs, but we do bring in money. So one of the things that, that came up, I know that made its way to me was, why do we offer these? Why don't we just offer whatever? I need people, we need to understand that students are going to be in class somewhere. Offering career technical education provides opportunity and brings in money. Additionally, all of our neighboring schools that outsource the, the services of career technical education to the county program all of our neighboring schools, their taxpayers see an additional millage of 2.99 mills. That's not, that doesn't go to 
and I went to West Carrollton, and I know that they use the CTC. But the taxpayers at West Carrollton, they, they, they pay their voted levies and the inside mills and all of that to their schools. And then they have a CTC 2.99 mills that they'll see on their, on their tax bill. For Centerville, Washington Township, that equates to $8.5 million annually. I don't have the exact number, but I believe that we are running our career technical education program uh, at five times cheaper than that. That, that. that we would be sending five times the amount that we run our career technical education program out of Centerville, Kettering, and Oakwood uh, to the county program. So uh, I, I believe we are providing career technical programming at CHS through the compact and it provides our students with accessible program and it's fiscally responsible. Um, important factors as regards to these three programs. One, I don't know if you've been paying attention, I, I think our board has, but there is no longer Ohio Department of Education. It is the Ohio Department, I, I think they don't, I think they took out Ohio, but uh, Department of Education and Workforce. They have merged the responsibility for building the workforce, the future workforce, with the Department of Education. Um, over the last two years, 300 million in grants has been uh, provided to support specifically new career technical education programs um, in Ohio. There's a new part of the state report card that's coming online this year for the first time, college, career, workforce, and military readiness. All these programs I've dis described today will be measures or ways of, of, of um, you know, uh, achieving the goals of this component of the report card. Uh, we continue to see pressure from things like US News and World Reports. We actually have moved up 10 places Maybe that's something to celebrate in U.S. News and World Reports since 2019. They have four components they evaluate schools on, two of which are AP participation and passage rates on AP tests. So half of them play into that. And lastly, I think that um, we'll continue to monitor programming and move forward with opportunity in mind for our students and our families, but also being fiscally responsible. Any questions for me? The Perkins grant that you mentioned, is that a federal grant? Yes. How many classes can they fail in college credit class before they're taken out of the program? Is there a number or? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a little in the weeds for me, but uh, there they, there is a probationary. You get one if you fail, I believe it's you, if you fail one um, period semester, I don't think it's one, they, they look at your GPA and how many courses, but if you get into academic like probation and then uh, don't recover from that, uh, it's kind of a two strikes and you're out. So let me just get this, wrap this around my head. So if we didn't do a career tech program, we said we can't afford it, the levies failed, we can't afford it, and we then outsourced it all the residents would get approximately 2.99 mills added onto their tax bill? That's the current rate for Montgomery County for any anybody utilizing the so, CTC. So if that was a cost-saving measure for us, if we're asking 3.9, we get rid of career tech, they're going to pay 2.9 more. <laughs> We're not going to get rid of it. I'm I, just, would, they're just I would say at least because there's no way they can house that many kids. Right. So it would cost uh, the taxpayer even more money. I mean, they would have to build to take Kettering right. and Centerville on. Okay. Which so they just be, did a bond issue. That would be a way issue. to offset our losses if it would fail. Just want to know. Okay. You can run those numbers. <laughs> We're not going to get rid of it. I'm just <laughs> okay, I wasn't going to leave until we did that declaration. <laughs> All right. Anything All right. else? Thank you. Thank you. Um, and last but not least, Mr. Krogel. Thank you. Uh, I did not have a uh, presentation on the screen, but you've got a couple handouts there in front of you today. Uh, the, there's a couple landscape plans and then a map of uh, Centerville High School and the uh, farm uh, next door. Um, 
really we've got two resolutions for easement and construction um, for approval uh, this evening. Um, the first, uh, number four on the list, uh, uh, they're very similar. Both are very similar, uh, but I want to make sure that you guys understand the difference there. Number four uh, is, is, is the component here at CHS, uh, which deals with access as well as construction easement. Um, th that is just so that the uh, uh, the city and the, the the workers for the trees can can have access to the to the property next door, and so that is what number four is. And, and number five is uh, the farmland, uh, which is again owned by uh, Centerville City Schools. Uh, most of the uh, trees, all of the trees are going to be cut down are on the the property that's located um, just behind the hill here, and then as well as in the area over by um, the the Dimco Gray Corporation. So both of those areas are highlighted uh, on that map that you have there in front of you. And uh, again, the reason for these is just so that these trees can be removed removed prior to the end of March. This is um, in regards to the building of the egress. Correct. Road. Correct. Yes. yes. This has to do with the uh, the Dimco Way Road project. Yes. Okay. And the um, the city is taking on the cost and the responsibility for cutting down the trees. This isn't an expense to the district. This is We're simply granting the them the access. This is just granting them access, right. uh, number one, to our property, uh, number one, and then number two, um, uh, allowing them under our property to, to bring the, uh, the, the tree workers on. Great. Any questions? Yep. All right. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Uh, moving on to treasurer's recommendations. Is there a motion to consider approving the January 2024 financial statements, including the monthly fund general, monthly general fund rolling report, monthly cash reconciliation, monthly fund activity report, then and now purchase orders approved by administration, certified by the treasurer, and supported by board resolution, totaling ten thousand one hundred twenty-six dollars and sixty-four cents. So Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Dahl. Yes. Dr. Grath. Yes. Dr. Rohr. Yes. Megan Sparks. Yes. Mrs. Dernbaugh. Yes. Uh, consider approving the minutes of the following Board of Education meetings, January 22nd, 2024 regular meeting, and February 12th, 2024 work session. Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Dahl. Yes. Dr. Graff. Yes. Dr. Rohr. Yes. Megan Sparks. Yes. Mrs. Dernbaugh. Yes. Um, superintendent's recommendations. The superintendent recommends accepting resignations as listed on Schedule A. Superintendent recommends the employment, change of employment status or change of contract status for the certificated per personnel listed on Schedule B for the salaries programs and on the effective dates given. Superintendent recommends the employment or change of employment status for the support staff personnel listed on Schedule C for the salaries programs and on the effective dates given. Superintendent recommends the employment of the personnel listed on Schedules D and D1 for supplemental contracts or extra duty assignments. And superintendent recommends the granting of leaves of absence for the personnel listed on Schedule E for the reason and on the dates given. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Dahl? Yes. Dr. Graff? Yes. Dr. Rohr? Yes. Megan Sparks? Yes. Mrs. Dernbaugh? Yes. Consider authorizing continued membership in the Ohio High School Athletic Association for the 2023-2024 school year. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? We talked about this earlier, annual item. It's an annual item. Uh, we do it every year uh, about this time. Uh, we talked at length about this uh, at a work session, but this is just a routine membership to OHSAA. All right. Call the roll, please. Mr. Dahl? Yes. Dr. Graff? Yes. Dr. Rohr? Yes. Megan Sparks? Yes. Mrs. Dernbaugh? Yes. Consider approving a farm lease between Centerville City Schools and Lucas Brothers Farms for both Sheehan and Franklin Street properties. So moved. Second. Again, annual item um, brings in. We've been very fortunate to have Lucas Brothers uh, Farm, the property next to Central High School, and our property we own on Sheehan Road. Uh, it just gives us an opportunity to have one more set of eyes and ears on the property um, to help us ma manage and maintain those properties, uh, which is a benefit to the district and also a benefit to Lucas Brothers Farms. All right. Call the roll, please. Mr. Dahl? Yes. Dr. Graff? Yes. Dr. Rohr? Yes. Megan Sparks? Yes. Mrs. Dernbaugh? Yes. Item four, consider a resolution authorizing the execution of a temporary access and construction easement 
granting a temporary easement to the city of Centerville. Can we do those together? Yeah. Um, also, uh, let's separate them because one is for the high school property. Oh, right. Because they'll need access from the high school property and also access to the farm property. That's why there's two very separate. Okay. Is there a motion for item four? I move. Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Dahl? Yes. Dr. Graff? Yes. Dr. Rohr? Yes. Megan Sparks? Yes. Mrs. Dernbaugh? Yes. And item five, consider a resolution authorizing the execution of a temporary construction easement, granting temporary easement to the city of Centerville. Don't move. Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Dahl? Yes. Dr. Graff? Yes. Dr. Rohr? Yes. Megan Sparks? Yes. Mrs. Dernbaugh? Yes. Um, any final comments regarding past or old business from the board? I would like to thank everyone who came and stayed tonight for a very long meeting. <laughs> not, not usual we have these kind of long meetings, so I appreciate everyone staying and being so attentive. I want to thank Representative Young for being here not only tonight, but last week. We really appreciate your participation. I think you gave some very good information at our meeting last Thursday. So thank you for coming and participating. I'd like to thank Mr. Wesney for being here tonight on his birthday. Oh, happy birthday, happy Mr. Birthday. Wesley. <clears throat> That's too bad our teacher left. I would have let her sing happy birthday. <laughs> thank you. It's tough to be 39, isn't it? <laughs> this is the only place I'd rather be tonight. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, pursuant to Ohio Revised Code, Section 121.22G1, is there a motion to move that the board adjourn to executive session? For the purpose of considering the employment and dismissal of public employees of the school district, Ohio Revised Code, Section 121.22G4, to review negotiations or bargaining sessions with public employees concerning their compensation or other terms and conditions of their employment, and Ohio Revised Code, Section 121.22G2, to consider the sale and purchase of real property. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Dahl? Yes. Dr. Graff? Yes. Dr. Rohr? Yes. Megan Sparks? Yes. Mrs. Dernbaugh? Yes, and we are in executive session. <laughs>